Won't you open your Bibles to Luke chapter 4. I'm continuing with a series that we started a few weeks ago. And so what I really want to encourage you to do is if you haven't been here last week or the week before, um, I would encourage you to go and stream those and listen to those because it really gives a context and gives a foundation to where we are and where we're going. Um, The challenge is you can never do kind of a a decent summary of where you've been because you run out of time by the time you finish your summary. So you kind of have to build on where you are. Um, Luke chapter four, verse 16. So he came, it's talking about Jesus, came to Nazareth where he had been brought up. And as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read. And he was handed the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Then he closed the book and gave it back to the attendant and sat down. And the eyes of all who were in the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began to say to them, today the scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. So all bore witness to him and marveled at the gracious words which proceeded out of his mouth. And they said, is this not Joseph's son? I want to speak this morning on something I've titled, The Power is in His Word. The Power is in His Word. Acts chapter 11 is the first place where Christians or followers of Jesus were referred to as Christians. Um, Can you pull us back a little bit, buddy? First place where followers of Jesus were referred to as Christians. At its basic meaning, what Christians really means is belonging to the Christ, belonging to the anointed one. And at its heart, what it really means is it speaks about lordship. You're not a Christian because you're not Hindu or Muslim or another religion. You weren't classified as being a Christian because you were someone who knew who Jesus was. You weren't classified and they didn't label you as a Christian because you were someone who even believed in Christ. You were a Christian because Jesus was your Lord. There's a big difference. It's an invitation to Lordship. And what it really does is the reason that it's so important is because when we find our identity and when we find our place, in who he is, when we find an expression of our our identity in the anointing and we begin to live from that place, what we end up doing is we live out of the anointing. But you have to find yourself in the anointing before you can live out of it. Christians was an invitation to step into the anointing. We have too many Christians nowadays who live good lives, who have an appetite, who love God, who go to church with frequency, who read their Bibles, who watch Christian television, who read lots of books, and they have no power in their life. You were called to be Christ-like. You were called to be a person of power. You were called to be a person who was anointed and lived in the anointing. That's what we're called to be. And so our endeavor and our pursuit is to become something like that. In Proverbs chapter two, it says, raise up a child in the way that he should go, and when he is older, he will not depart from it. So Sarah and I, our endeavor with our children is to raise them up in a way so that we build into them the building blocks of life that establish the foundation for their life so that when they're older, they handle life and they deal with life out of the foundation that's put into them. It's not just what you say, it's what you model. It's not just what you celebrate, but it's the actual impartation that's made into their lives. Why is it important? Because the thing is, we're going to get to a place ultimately where you're not going to be there to have influence in their life. And you need to know that what's established is the foundation of their life. They're equipped to handle life in a spiritual context and a natural context. You are spirit, soul, and body. So we to raise our kids up in an understanding of that. And so they step into the fullness of being and they step into success in all three dimensions of life. Center to everything is their spiritual dimension. 
The moment you got born again, the Holy Spirit was tasked with a responsibility. And the responsibility that he was tasked with was raise them up in the way that they should go. Because when they are older, they will not depart from it. What is he doing? The Holy Spirit's always at operation. He's always working in your life. And what he's doing in your life is he's taking you from a place where you used to be a natural person and all of a sudden you're stepping into a dimension of power. You used to be a person who lived and managed your own life, but suddenly you're beginning to recognize the fact that if I want to step into the anointing, I need to step into the lordship of Jesus in my life. So the Holy Spirit is working with us to raise us up. The Holy Spirit is doing something in our lives so that when we move to that place and we get to a place of maturity, we live out of what's been established on the inside of us. The invitation and the call is one of maturity. It's how you mature as a Christian. Are you maturing in the things of him or are you maturing on your own and an expression of his life? There are many churches who give expression to the kingdom. Natural expression, it's called religion. Anytime you have to do the work, you've taken something from the kingdom and you've moved it into the natural paradigm and you're trying to live it out. It's called religion because it's all about me. The kingdom is all about him. The center and the focus of the kingdom is all about him. He's always bringing us to the place where he's sitting saying, where am I in this situation? Where am I in your life? Where am I in your decision making? Because it's all about him. We make a decision every single day as to whether we want to take ourselves to a place where we move into the lordship of, of, of Jesus in our lives. When the, holy, when the angel appeared to Mary and the angel spoke to Mary and the angel said to Mary, I want to tell you something. I've got to tell you some news. Some stuff is going to happen to you. You're not really going to be able to have a full comprehension and an understanding of what it is that I'm saying, but I'm going to tell you this anyway. The Holy Spirit is going to come upon you and you are going to conceive. And when you conceive, you're going to give birth to a child and his name is going to be called Jesus. The conception that came from the Holy Spirit was the life of God. Conception was the very nature of God that formed the basis and the foundation to who Jesus was. And he was the word wrapped in flesh. But he was fundamentally two parts. His nature and who he was. His spirit was always alive to God. He was the word made flesh. And when Jesus was born, from the moment he was born up until the age that he was 30, it constitutes roughly 90% of his life. And he lived as Jesus of Nazareth. And do you know, if you have a look in the Bible, there is almost no account of Jesus of Nazareth. Very little detail. We know very little about 90% of Jesus' life. Very, very little. But it reached a point where Jesus said, you know what? I understand that I was born with purpose. I understand that I was born with a mission. And in order for me to accomplish my mission, in order for me to fulfill what I'm here to do, I can no longer live as Jesus of Nazareth. I'm going to have to step over the... I'm going to have to step over the threshold. Good, great. Let's start again. In order to fulfill my mission, in order to fulfill what God has called me to do, I can no longer live as Jesus of Nazareth. I have to cross the threshold and all of a sudden, I'm gonna to begin to live as Jesus the Christ. Jesus the anointed one. The anointed one who lives out of the anointing. Because what ends up happening is when I live out as the anointed one and out of the anointing, I can fulfill my mission. I can fulfill my purpose on life. I can fulfill the destiny that I've been called to do. I cannot accomplish it as Jesus of Nazareth. For three years, roughly 10% of Jesus' life, he lived as Jesus the Christ, Jesus the anointed one. Do you know how powerful it was? It changed from that moment. And the Torah ceased to exist. And we have something called the New Testament. The entire New Testament constitutes everything that came about when he said, I am the Christ, the anointed one. 10% of his life, lived from the anointing. 10% of his life lived as the Christ. And the books of the Bible could not contain all the things that he did and accomplished in that. You want to change your life? You want to have influence? Start to live from the anointing. As long as you live from the natural, you will constitute the 90% who become ambiguous and gray and you fall into everything. Nobody knows anything about you. But you move into the 10%. You make a decision that I'm going to step over the threshold and I'm no longer going to live as I was, but I'm going to live as who I am. 
Gavin, a new creation in Christ. All of a sudden, I've stepped into the anointing. All of a sudden, I've moved to a place where I've said, who I am and what I'm all about is subject to his lordship. And when you subject yourself to his lordship, you put yourself in a place of blessing. A place of blessing means you subject yourself to his influence, and what comes with his influence is his anointing. What's his anointing? His power. Part of the reason that we have so many Christians who have no power is because they haven't subjected themselves and put it under his lordship. Just saying. It's for all the people on the beach today. <laughs> if your flesh is screaming, don't worry, it's just flesh. It's just your flesh. Let me tell you something. When God starts to move you from who you were in the natural and he starts to migrate you to who you are, the new created being, the first thing that's going to squeal is going to be your flesh. Anytime your flesh has a voice, it's a red light to you. Identify it. It's just flesh. But I'm so scared and I'm so apprehensive and I'm so nervous. You take it and you bring it under his subjection. You bring it under his lordship and he says, you know what? Through me, you're more than a conqueror. You're an overcomer. You can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And I get let go of who I was and I subject it to his lordship. But your emotions are going to scream. But what about? And what if this happens? And, then, and what will they think of you? And then, and then it's just your flesh. It's just your flesh. Every time you have to make a decision about things, what are you deciding? Are you deciding from the place of where you were or are you deciding from the place of who he is in you? I'm tired of dealing with people from, the, this is just me. This, I, every, every time I get a commercial break, this is my commercial break in this one. I'm getting tired of dealing with people who live in this area. I'm getting tired of dealing with people. It's like, well, you don't understand. I'm so upset. Why are you upset? It's your flesh. <laughs> well, you don't understand. I'm just so fearful of it. What's fearful? Your flesh. Well, you don't understand. You know, the way that they treated me. <laughs> okay, so you're offended. What's offended? Your flesh. <laughs> it's just flesh. Let go of it. Because the truth of it is, we are not here and he has called us to a place of maturity. A place of maturity says, you know what? I recognize what the anointed one and what the anointing is doing in this place. I'm recognizing what it's doing in your life and other people's life. And I'm here to esteem it. I'm here to value it. I'm here to encourage it in whatever way I can. And if it costs me my reputation, and if it means that I might be offended, and if it means that my flesh is unsettled, I can live with that. Well, I don't like that praise and worship. You don't understand, you know? It's so noisy, and why can't they just sing hymns? It's just your flesh. It's just your flesh. Sometimes we've got to get over our flesh to get into the anointing. And if you can't get over your flesh, you will live without the anointing. We've got too many Christians who have no power and no anointing in their lives. We can't have any more. It's enough. When Jesus died, Jesus died as your Lord and Savior. When he died as your Savior, what he did is, he said, I'm opening the opportunity for the life of God to come and dwell on the inside of you. His Savior, as Savior, what he did is, he said, what I'll do is, I will take who you were, I will take your spirit, and I'll put my life on the inside of it, and you'll become a new creation in Christ. What he does is, he takes his life, and he puts it on the inside of you, and you become a brand new creation. The kingdom is deposited on the inside of you. What is the kingdom? People talk about the kingdom in some nebulous term. The kingdom is this, any area that constitutes the rule of God. The reason that you get born again and the kingdom comes to reside within you is because the ruler, the king, comes inside and makes you a new creation and you become the temple of the Holy Ghost. What are you? You're a person who subjected your spirit to the lordship of who he is. That's why the kingdom resides within you. What he says is this, now that I've got your spirit, I want the rest of you. The thing about it is you decide how much of the rest of you gets into the kingdom. It's no longer I who, but how does Christ begin to live in you? Because every single day I have a decision. So I have a look at my wife and I scream and I shout and I carry on and it's like, really, that's the best way to handle it. How do I take that and I move it into the kingdom so I say, Father, you know what? I don't want to behave like a banshee all my life. So I'm bringing this and I'm submitting it to you and I'll tell you what, I want your lordship to come in and to have influence over this place. Show me how to treat people appropriately with respect and with honor. 
Gee, I'm so prideful. It's all about me. What's happening with me? What do people think about me? My reputation, it's all, bring it to the, it's about your Lordship, Father. Tell me. I want it to be part of the kingdom. I want it to express kingdom values. How do I do that? Show me what it's all about. And he says, you know what? The problem with it is, it's just your flesh speaking. Let go of it and come in over here. I got a new job and I'm so anxious and I'm so nervous and I'm so fearful and what if I can do it and what if I can't do it and what if I don't have the skills and take it to him. Don't indulge the flesh. It's no longer I who live but Christ who lives in me. So you take it over and you say to him, Father, I've got this new job and my flesh is screaming at me and it's telling me all of this stuff. I wanna bring it into your lordship. Tell me what I should do about this. And he says, you know what? I'm so glad you did that because greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. And I want you to know something now. I've set before you life and death, blessings and cursings and you choosing life. We're going the right way. You're gonna find favor and I'm gonna open up doors of opportunity for you. And all of a sudden you sit and say, I can change my life. Why? Because I'm living from a place of favor. Jesus said, I only do the things I see the Father do. I only do the things I see the Father do. What is he talking about? He was saying, I don't live from my old man. I'm living from my new man. And my new man in communion with God, in that place of intimacy with God, gives me the opportunities for he and I to come into a place where we talk about everything. And I share with him what's happening. And I share with him my life. And I share with him what I see around me. And I talk to him about the people in my life. And he talks to me. And he says, you know what? I'll tell you what you need to do with the situation. And he shares with me. And what he shares with me colors my world that I live in with him. And when I see that and I understand that, when I come into a paradigm where, a, where somebody says, how are you going to handle the situation? His point of reference was always, what did I see with the Father? And he lives from that place. What will change your life is when we get to the place where we can hear what the Father says. What did Jesus say to Peter? Who do people say that I am? And he says, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And what did he say? He said, blessed are you, Peter. Why are you blessed? Because flesh and blood has not revealed this for to you, but my father who is in heaven. What is he saying? He was saying the moment you understand relationship, the moment you recognize that point of intimacy, the moment you get to the place where you and him are in conversation, you've opened the door to blessing. And on this rock, I will build my church. What is he saying? I want you to establish the foundation of your life on revelation. Your natural man is designed to create its world through our senses. That's how God designed it. So I listen to what people say, and I don't know why, but every now and again I listen to the news. And I listen to odds and ends. And I hear what things are going on all the time. And I feel what happens to me as a result of my involvement in situations and I see stuff around the place, and I hear what's going on, and I participate in things, what is it doing? It's informing my natural world. I have a natural picture as to what world is like, what the world should be like, and I, with the minute I start to live out of that place, I recognize the fact that this is informed from all of my natural senses. But God says the old things have passed away and all things have become new. The way that God has designed for us to live in a place where that is colored of him is through revelation knowledge. Unless you, it's not some weird thing. It's in conversation with God. Blessed are you because flesh and blood hadn't revealed this to you, but the Father who's in heaven revealed this to you. Until we get to the place where we're having conversations with God, you'll never understand the world of the kingdom. That's not the way God's designed it. God's design is if you want to understand kingdom life, if you want to walk in the fullness of kingdom life, you're going to have to have conversation with God. That's just the way that he's designed it, and it's not going to work any other way. Three kids, Colton, Carter, and Vivian. We're outnumbered. <laughs> you know, they say two's company, three's a crowd. And it happens every now and again. So we have this area in the basement that we've completed for the kids so that they can go down there and they can do whatever they want. It's their space. They can have fun and they can do it and they enjoy it and they go and, and anyway, they, they play all kinds of games down there. And um, the, the game of the moment is dodgeball. 
They love, I see a lot of you play it. Dodgeball, they love dodgeball. And they know all the tricks and all the tactics. And so, you know, if you squish it up really tight and you squeeze all the air out of it, it goes a whole lot faster and it's much harder. I learned these things, Colton taught me. <laughs> and so they go downstairs and they play and they're having lots of fun. And Sarah and I are sitting upstairs and we know, I don't know, whatever. And then you hear, bah, blah, 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 blah. and then you hear tears and you hear this and you hear that and you hear the next thing. And you're like, okay, it's coming. And up comes Vivian, and Vivi says, Dad, it's not fair. Have you ever noticed with kids, that's, that's the introduction. <laughs> it's not fair. Okay, and then we let go. It's not fair. The boys are not playing to the rules. They are cheating. And I'm the youngest, and they, I'm the smallest, and they make me do all of this stuff. And when I told them that I wasn't playing anymore, they said to me, you're just a baby. They called me names. <laughs> She's waiting. So I say to Vivi, listen to me. You go and tell the boys. Number one, they to play by the rules. Okay? Everybody plays by the rules. Secondly, no calling names. We respect one another, and if you have a disagreement, you solve it, you don't call each other names. Thirdly, they need to give you a little bit of consideration because you are the youngest. And she says, thank you, Dad. <laughs> and she bullets downstairs. Why? Because she's armed with something she never had before. All of a sudden, the king of the domain, our house, has spoken. And when the king of the domain has spoken, it carries power. And so when I take the king's power and I speak to my brothers and I say, this is what the king has said. What he's saying, what she's saying is, I'm delivering a message to you that comes from above. <laughs> and she knows. If you don't heed the word of the king, he is gonna come down here and he will make sure the word happens. <laughs> Words are important. Our house is governed by rules. We have rules that establish the way that we live. It establishes the parameters and so in that context, we understand, we love one another. We are all different but we respect our individuality. You honor the person. You watch how you speak to them. You do not use inappropriate language and you do not call people names. We have rules that govern the domain called my home. It sets the culture that we live in because the expectation is that you live up to that culture. As a participant and a citizen of this kingdom, that's what we're looking for. The thing about it is this, every now and again, you have a skirmish. Something happens in the context of the domain that a rule isn't going to fix. Sometimes there's a skirmish and what you need is power to bring about transformation. And when you need power, where do you go to get power? You go to the king. Why? Because when the king speaks, you can take what he says and you can go and enforce that. Because all of a sudden, I have delegated authority to use his power to say, this is what's going to happen. It's got nothing to do with Vivi because behind Vivi is the king. We have the Logos, which is the word of God. And the word of God sets is very important. Always get into the word of God. It's a valuable tool. But really what it does is it sets the climate for the kingdom and what God is looking for. It sets the tone and it sets the culture for the kingdom. The thing about the Logos is you don't have to be a person who understands and lives from the secret place in order to have the Logos. In fact, you don't even have to have the life of God on the inside of you to have the Logos. You can be an atheist and have the Logos. 
You can live from this place of where I'm natural and I can know the Logos, but the Logos is not gonna change your life. You have gotta have a word from God. You have got to have the rhema because there are times in life where you understand what God's intention is. You understand what culture God is looking for. You understand what the expectation is of the kingdom, but you need power to make some stuff happen. And when you need power, you gotta go and have a word with the king. If you don't have a rhema, you can't change your world. The Logos is not going to change your world. It's a rhema that's going to change your world. There's no power in the Logos. The power is in the rhema. If you're not speaking to the king, you're excluding yourself from power. We think prayers are at the end of the day. Father, I thank you for today, and I thank you that you're gonna look after me tomorrow and take care of me tomorrow and bless me tomorrow and provide for me tomorrow. And blah, 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 me, 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 amen. <laughs> but I got no word from him. Prayer is conversation with God. It's a lifestyle. What he's saying is, take the different aspects of who you are and bring it to a place of conversation. Bring it to a place where you say, Father, what do you think about this? I'm looking for a word. I'm looking for him to give me something because when he gives me something, what ends up happening is I know what his attitude is. I know what his disposition is. I understand where his power is and I can take that and when I go out into my world, I become a person who takes the anointing with me and I introduce it into my circumstances. If you have no word, you have no anointing. You've got to get a word from him. You've got to get a word from him. Something happens to you when you talk to the king. When Vivian comes and talks to me, she comes initially and she feels disheartened and she feels broken and she feels ill-equipped to handle stuff because they're bigger than me, and they're older than me, and they're stronger than me, and they throw the ball harder than me. Life is tough. But when she begins to talk to the king, and the king says, Vivi, let me tell you something. You go and tell him this. You are valuable, you're a good sport, you're a great person, you play really well. You got, what ends up happening when I'm sitting talking to the king? All of a sudden, something starts to change within me. When the king says to me, you know what? I'll tell you what, I'm on your side. And I'll tell you what we're going to do to change this around. I'm going to give you this. And I'll tell you how, what I want you to do is I want you to take that stuff and I want you to... What ends up happening? All of a sudden, I start to change in myself and I develop a new disposition towards things. I develop something called confidence to take the things of what the king is telling me and go and live them out. She had no reservation going downstairs saying, Boys! <laughs> Daddy says... Why was she so confident? Because she had faith in what I had said. Where does faith come from? Okay, for the side, it's hearing. (laughs) It's hearing the word of God. Faith comes by hearing. It doesn't come from hearing the Logos, it comes from hearing the Rhema. If you have no relationship with God, you're gonna have no faith. That's not me, it's the Bible. (laughs) Don't throw chairs at me, I never said it. If you have no power, if you, if you have no relationship and no communication with God, you have no power. That's just the way it is. Because you see, what happens is when God speaks to you, what he says is, I'm giving you my will and I'm giving you my intention for that. And the power that constitutes who I am is gonna back that. So when you take that and you act on that, things are gonna change and things are gonna happen. God lives in a realm called the spirit realm. So that's why he says to us, we wrestle not against flesh and blood. You think your wife is the problem. This is just to all the men. All the women, just close your hum for a minute. You think your wife is the problem, but you wrestle not against flesh and blood. You think your boss is the problem. It doesn't matter what's happening in your life. The sickness is not the problem. The poverty is not the problem. The issue is the root behind it. What God is saying is this. We wrestle, we wrestle not against flesh and blood. What he's saying is, I want you to understand something. When you come and you speak to me, I'm gonna give you tools and I'm gonna give you equipment and I'm gonna give you a spiritual arsenal to take out and to deal with the things that you see out there. But what you're gonna do is you're gonna deal with the root behind them, not the issue. Because when you say to sickness, God says, something happens. Peter and John walking along. And
And they're walking along and they come to a gate. And there's a lame man lying there. And he's begging. And Peter looks at him. And he makes an interesting comment. And he makes a comment Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I unto you. What is he saying? He was saying, I understand your predicament and I understand where you are, but I'm not going to live from flesh and blood because flesh and blood is going to give you charity. What I'm going to do is I'm going to live from the anointing with the anointed one. But what I do have, such as I have, give I unto thee. What did he do? He had spent time with the Father and he knew what the Father's disposition and attitude was towards sickness and disease. And so when he saw it manifested in that place, he referred back to his conversation with God and he said, such as I have, give I unto thee. And he spoke to the lameness and he cursed it. And what he did was he ended up pulling the man up and said, rise up and walk. Why? Because he had a word from God. Because he understood where the power was. Because, where he, because he understood where the anointing was. Because he understood the fact that God had given him delegated authority to manage God's power. When Vivi walks off, it's not her power that changes everything. It's mine. But I've given her the authority to use it. God's looking and expecting us as little Christians to be able to take our authority and to use our authority with regard to his power. His power does the work, but we manage it through our authority. The problem with it is we have too many Christians and too many churches who live from charity. Let me give you some money and I'll take care of it. Let's introduce you to the soup kitchen. There's nothing wrong with all of those things in and of themselves. We always help people. And it is always a good thing if you can be at a place where you can put something in somebody's life to aid them. But what you don't do is you don't enable their current disposition. What you do is you say, I will help you with that, but the purpose of everything is to introduce you to something greater. And the greatness is the anointed one in his anointing. Because you don't have to stay where you are and keep begging and I can feed you and I can take care of you and all the rest of it. It's so much better if you could get your legs back. When you live from this place of intimacy with God and you live from this place where the two of you are in conversation, what ends up happening is you develop a place that is sacred between the two of you. And when you've developed this place and when you understand how this place operates, when you spend time in that secret place, what ends up happening is God says, he that dwells in the secret place of the most high shall abide under the shadow of the almighty and I will say of my God he is my refuge and my fortress my God in him will I trust go and read Psalm 91 Psalm 91 is all about that place of intimacy between you and God and what he's saying is I'm going to define what that space looks like and what he says is you can hold on to any of those promises because all of those promises are true when you discover what it is for you and I to come into that place of intimacy where you allow me to speak into your life The challenge with people who are Christians is that it develops within us a compassion for people. I'm going somewhere, the compassion's not the problem. We develop a compassion for people. But until we're able to cross the threshold and move from a natural man and live from a place of the anointing, what ends up happening is we try to fix people, help people, aid people from where we were. The problem with it is, you can, I use counseling as an example. I don't like counseling. I think counseling has its place, and I understand the value of giving somebody good advice. There are better ways to handle your money, better ways to deal with your marriage situation, better ways to handle your, there are things that you can put into people, and that's fine, it may be helpful. But the fact of the matter is, it's the anointing that breaks the yoke. You see, a lot of people who come in and a lot of people who've got recurring issues in their life is because there's something fundamental. There is some little root at the heart of everything that is feeding everything, that's driving everything. If you're wondering why you keep going around the same mountain, you need to go meet with him. Because people can give you advice as to how to live your life and how to manage your life and how to manage your interactions and everything else. But the fact of the matter is it's the anointing that breaks the yoke. And if you can get yourself in a place where you're exposed to the anointing, what ends up happening is once the root is pulled out, you don't behave that way anymore. 
The minute the root comes out, all of a sudden I have a different disposition on the things that I used to have before. And things I used to need, I don't want them anymore. And things that used to hold on to me, all of a sudden, they're not there anymore because they're not a part of my essential baggage for being a person who's anointed and part of the anointing. God is always at a place where he's introducing us to that place of intimacy with him. He's always sitting saying, you know what? I've done my part and I'm affording you the opportunity to take responsibility for taking my power and doing something with it. If you want to change your life, if you want to change your world, if you want access to power, you're going to have to live out of the anointing. The only place you find anointing is when you bring your place, your, your life into subjection to him. And you say, it's no longer about anything it used to be. It's all about him and what it is that you want. We are called to be people of power. Let me have a sip and then I've got one last thought. What I'm talking about right at the moment is, an important, is important for us as a church. Because the place that we want to go to is a place that celebrates the anointing. The place that we want to go to is a place where we appreciate and we value him and the kingdom. Which means it's going to place a demand on all of us. A demand of maturity. A place where we sit and say, I'm going to view my disposition, my place, and my contribution from a place of maturity and from a place of intimacy with the Father. We can't look for something that is anointed but still live in the natural. We've got to make a decision about the two things. The decision I've made for me and the ministry is... I'm not going to pay terribly much more attention to the flesh. It's not going to happen anymore. As a ministry, what changes people's lives is the anointing. What breaks the yoke is the anointing. Where the power is, is in the anointing. And at every opportunity, we use those times to celebrate what God is doing in us corporately and through us as individuals. Come in with the expectation on Sunday sitting saying, Father, what is the anointing going to do today? Let me leave my baggage at the door and let's talk about us. What is he going to put into your life this week that you're going to get so excited about so that when you come in next week, you can't wait to sit down and tell Pastor Kathy how excited you are about what's going on in this and that and the next thing. How can you get so excited? Okay, I could go on forever about that. And I'm running out of time. That's why I have to just paraphrase this. One last thing. That's why we value praise and worship. You may think... Nothing happens in praise and worship. Let me just say this. And I'll only say this once in my entire life. Maybe. <laughs> praise and worship is more important than the preaching. Listen to me. I'll tell you why. What changes your life is the intimacy with him. When we create a corporate space for you to come into a place where you can recognize and move into that point of intimacy between him and you, it gives you the opportunity to take your baggage from the week and say, Father, listen, I love you so much. Talk to me about this stuff. It gives him the opportunity to use his anointing to come in and do things in your life I can't do. And neither can anybody else. Value that space. Honor that space. Make an intention to participate in that. Your flesh is going to cry. And your flesh is going to say, you look stupid. And your flesh is going to say, we never did this when we were at the Presby Church down whatever road. It doesn't matter what. The thing about it is, if you recognize value and worth, grab it with both hands and run with it. Sometimes what holds us back from the blessing is that we're more concerned about what people will say and think than letting go of our flesh and stepping into a place of anointing. When we have great praise and worship and we introduce a space where you can move into the anointing and it can touch your life, you don't need preaching. Trust me, there'll be a time and a place and you'll get it. 
But nothing, nothing is as important as the word that you get from daddy. When daddy speaks, life changes. Father, we just want to thank you for your goodness. We want to thank you, Father, for the life that's alive on the inside of us. We want to thank you for kingdom realities. And as we move through this week, Holy Spirit, I pray that you just put a guard on our tongue and on our thoughts and on the way that we see things and on what we hear. And I pray that throughout the week that you will use those opportunities to bring each one of those things into subjection of your lordship. And let us not let things be planted in our lives that are in any way outside of what your kingdom truth is. I thank you, Father, that as we move to that space where we hear what you're saying to us and your design for our life, it moves us to a place where we walk into the fullness of what you've promised us. We thank you, Father, that we walk into becoming people who are anointed, people who live out of the anointing, people who experience and people who live in the expectation of the presence and your power. We bless you for it now. Amen.